Welcome to ChemHelp ASAP. This video describes the discovery of PRN1008, which is an inhibitor of BTK, Bruton's tyrosine kinase. PRN1008 focuses on inflammation-related indications. This video reports the discovery program of PRN1008 as described in a drug annotations article in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry by scientists at Principia Biopharma. Sanofi Company in South San Francisco, California. The citation is at the bottom of the screen and a link to the article can be found in the video description. This video is not an exhaustive discussion of the article. I am picking and choosing the highlights that I feel best summarize the research project. Bruton's tyrosine kinase, BTK, is a very well-established drug target. As part of the kinome, BTK plays a key role in pathways tied to multiple responses. BTK is expressed in many cells in blood, including immune cells. BTK has mostly received attention for certain types of cancer and is now also being explored for immune and inflammation-related conditions. On the screen are two early approved BTK inhibitors. These are oral small molecule drugs used to treat certain lymphomas and leukemias. The name of the drug target, Bruton's tyrosine kinase, is apparent in the non-proprietary names of both these compounds, ibrutinib and acalabrutinib. Ibrutinib received U.S. FDA approval in 2013 and acalabrutinib followed in 2017. Each of these compounds contains a reactive CC pi bond that allows them to covalently bind to BTK. These are therefore irreversible inhibitors, a trait that is less commonly seen in small molecule drugs. Research into inhibition of Bruton's tyrosine kinase has expanded beyond oncology. At the time of this video, both of these compounds are being explored in clinical trials with patients diagnosed with arthritis as well as other inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. Just like abrutinib and alcalabrutinib, these two compounds have reactive functional groups and are irreversible inhibitors. Most, but not all, BTK inhibitors under exploration bind irreversibly. Let's contrast the idea of reversible and irreversible target binding. Reversible binding, in the simplest sense, follows the equilibrium shown, with R being the target, perhaps a receptor, and the drug being L, a ligand. Binding is non-covalent and managed solely through intermolecular forces such as hydrogen bonding and hydrophobic effects. In general, drugs that bind reversibly have fairly short residence times on the target. Every target is different, but you do generally want to keep a target bound, engaged, or occupied as much as possible to maximize the effect of the ligand. Let's now consider irreversible binding for two reasons. One, the topic is relevant to the PRN1008 drug program. Two, discussing irreversible binding will better highlight the strengths and weaknesses of reversible binding. So here is a simple scheme of irreversible binding. We have no backwards arrow. The ligand chemically reacts with and covalently binds to the receptor. I note longer residence times, but the covalent bond makes the residence times essentially infinite. It's literally irreversible. The target protein has been permanently altered. This can lead to dosing benefits. If you combine all the target with one dose, the patient may enjoy the benefit for a long time, maybe as long as it takes for the cell to make more of the target protein. So longer binding might lead to lower or less frequent dosing. A drawback is the drug will have a measure of chemical reactivity. The drug may also react with other proteins, permanently disable them, and lead to increased toxicity from off-target effects. Therefore, selectivity in the reactivity is still critical. Interestingly, the Principia discovery team took a blended approach with PRN1008. The Principia scientists explored a reversible covalent BTK inhibitor. So the idea was to make a covalent bond, hopefully extending residence times with dosing benefits,
that can be reversibly formed and broken, hopefully diminishing off-target toxicity. Implementation of this idea actually goes back to work in a lab at the University of California at San Francisco. How can this work? Here is a scheme that demonstrates the chemistry. The drug, D, has a reactive electrophilic alkene that can be attacked by sulfur on a cysteine residue on the target R. The sulfur attacks in a Michael addition fashion. The resulting anionic intermediate is protonated to give the drug target complex with a new CS covalent bond. This key proton is fairly acidic because of the two neighboring electron withdrawing groups. Deprotonation takes us back to the anionic intermediate and the sulfur can be kicked right back out, breaking the covalent bond. This idea developed at UCSF was compelling enough that it led to the founding of a new drug company, Principia Biopharma. Every drug program starts with an assay to measure activity of new compounds. The primary assay was a biochemical assay for BTK occupancy. The idea was to expose BTK with a test compound, incubate for 15 minutes, and then wash out the excess compound. At this point, BTK should be covalently bound by the compound. You then add another ligand with a fluorescent label that competitively binds BTK. At certain time intervals, wash away the fluorescent ligand and then measure the fluorescence of BTK. Low fluorescence indicates that the BTK is still bound by the test compound and therefore has not bound the fluorescent label. The scientists also developed a cellular version as a secondary assay. Many discovery programs begin with random screening. The PRN1008 program started with the known BTK inhibitor, ibrutinib. The program started with most of the core of ibrutinib, the amino pyrazolopyrimidine portion. The aromatic rings in the upper right were unchanged except for introduction of a fluoro group. Initially, exploration focused on the linker between the core scaffold and the reactive alkene that Principia had developed. I show three variations, but the team certainly investigated many more. You can see they looked at BTK inhibition, as well as biochemical and cellular occupancy. They wanted to see high prolonged occupancy, called durable occupancy. Of these three options, the five and six-membered ring linkers look more promising with higher biochemical occupancy. All the subsequently studied compounds use these two linkers. For the rest of the video, we will exclusively show compounds with the six-membered ring piperidine series. Here on the left is the lead series scaffold shown with the piperidine ring linker. Research now focused on testing different R groups off of the alkene. Again, I'm showing just three compounds, but many more were synthesized and tested. You can see that more assays have been added, both the HWB assay and alpha assay refer to cellular assays with B cells. Assay methods and technologies are not my forte, so suffice it to say that lower numbers in these rows indicate promising activity by the test compound. As is seemingly always the case, the results from assays do not perfectly align. The compound with the highest cellular occupancy does not have the highest biochemical occupancy. The compound with the best potency in one cellular assay does not have the best potency for biochemical inhibition. Compounds 11 and 26 were advanced for further study. Compounds 11 and 26 are distinct in that 11 has a simple R group. 
a T-butyl group, and 26 has amino functionality in the side chain. This difference will become more relevant toward the end of this video. We've mentioned the importance of selectivity. Our bodies have hundreds of kinases managing many important functions. Compounds must achieve somewhat selective inhibition or else safety risks will be very high. This slide shows some selectivity concerns for compound 11. First, however, I want to highlight brutinib, an approved BTK inhibitor, in this first column. Ibrutinib has very poor selectivity, at least against the kinases in this table. How can ibrutinib be approved? Well, ibrutinib is an oncology drug, and oncology drugs are given more leeway on safety. A long-term drug for inflammation will need to be more selective. You can see that compound 11 already shows at least some moderate selectivity against these kinases relative to abrutinib based on IC50 values. In some cases, such as BLK, compound 11 shows poor selectivity based on IC50 alone, but much better selectivity based on the durability of occupancy. Let's now compare ADME and pharmacokinetic properties of 11 and 26. The top three rows are four in vitro ADME tests, and the bottom four rows are based on in vivo data in the rat. Compound 11 did not show promising permeability, and solubility was low with higher in vitro and in vivo clearance. Bioavailability was comparable between the two compounds. Compound 11 did, however, show better in vivo exposure Ultimately, compound 11 was advanced over 26, and I suspect that its better exposure was the critical factor. Exposure based on Cmax may have been more important than AUC. For covalent inhibitors, getting a burst of drug to engage the target is vital. The drug may then be quickly cleared to minimize systemic exposure, while the bound drug with durable occupancy retains on-target efficacy. Speaking of efficacy, let's see some in vivo efficacy data. Here are some data from an animal disease model involving rats with CIA, collagen-induced arthritis. This is a common model for rheumatoid arthritis. You induce arthritis in the rat, and swelling in the rat joints can be measured to determine progression of the disease over time. The study included a group of healthy rats as a baseline. The mean ankle diameter in the control group after 10 days was 0.26 inches, a surprising unit of measure. In contrast, untreated CIA rats had a larger diameter of 0.32 inches at the end of the study. An ascending dose of compound 11 reduced inflammation at 30 mg per kg administered once per day, swelling was reduced to almost the same level as the healthy rats. So this was a favorable outcome for compound 11. Let's touch upon some safety and toxicology results. Compound 11 showed no mutagenicity based on the AIMS test. Off-target toxicity risks were favorable based on a panel of transporters and ion channels. Compound 11 showed minimal Herg channel inhibition. A 12-week study in dogs demonstrated that compound 11 had a high no AEL, no observed adverse effect level. Determining a compound's no AEL is a critical step for determining allowed dosing levels for first-in-human trials. Compound 11 was advanced into clinical trials for the treatment of pemphigus vulgaris, a skin inflammation condition. Unfortunately, compound 11 had very low bioavailability in humans. Humans are not rats, and sometimes adequate exposure in rats does not translate into adequate exposure in humans. Research on compound 11 switched from oral administration to possibly a topical formulation. 
Principia did have backup lead compounds. Before showing the next lead, let's talk a bit more about this oral bioavailability issue and something called Lipinski's rules. This is not part of the drug annotations article, but I think it's relevant here. Lipinski's rules, or the rule of five, is a controversial topic. They are not rules. They are observations. The observations are shown to the bottom left. In general, orally absorbed drugs tend to have a molecular weight less than or equal to 500. They have a lipophilicity, as measured by log P, of 5 or lower. The number of hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen bond acceptors should be no higher than 5 and 10, respectively. Satisfying these rules in a molecule does not mean it will have high bioavailability, but it does mean it has a better chance of having favorable membrane permeability, an important aspect of bioavailability. Lipinski noted that compounds may violate one rule and still be bioavailable. Two violations, however, should be avoided. Okay, well our video started with ibrutinib. Here is ibrutinib with its Lipinski profile. No violations. Regardless, the bioavailability is still less than 10%. There is no cutoff for bioavailability, but 10% is uncommonly low. Let's look at compound 11. Compound 11 has two violations, molecular weight and log P. In hindsight, the low oral availability of 11 is not surprising, since ibrutinib is already not very available, and compound 11's Lipinski properties are less favorable than ibrutinib. How about the backup leads that Principia considered? Here is compound 12, the backup lead. It includes the amine side chain that we highlighted earlier. The molecular weight is even higher but compound 12 only has one violation. The hope was that 12, with its amine side chain, would have better ADME properties. Let's see. Here we have a comparison of 11 and 12. Note that 12 has improved permeability, much better solubility, and better metabolic stability. Furthermore, compound 12 appears to have very similar potency and efficacy relative to 11. Based on these data, 12 was advanced into the clinic. Compound 12 was considered for two indications, pemphigus vulgaris, PV, and immune thrombocytopenia, ITP. ITP is an immune-related platelet disorder. Compound 12 achieved satisfactory exposures in Phase 1, Phase 2 data were promising, and Phase 3 studies were ongoing at the time of submission of this article in July 2021. Unfortunately, Compound 12 failed in Phase 3 trials for PV in Fall 2021. Principia Biopharma's labs were subsequently closed by Sanofi, which had acquired Principia in 2020. This outcome is regrettably not uncommon in the biotech sector given the binary results of clinical trials. So in conclusion, to all the authors on this paper and other employees at Principia, I sincerely enjoyed reading about your research on BTK inhibitors, and I hope you have found new opportunities to use your talents and advance your careers. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of this drug discovery story. Please consider subscribing to the channel, leaving a like, or making a comment. Take care.